Being a photojournalist is really about storytelling. It's a different thing every day. The, no two days are ever the same. 451, 452. There's a basic level of satisfaction in that, you know, when you started your day, this didn't exist. This story didn't exist. It's very powerful. It's breathtaking. You wrap it all into a story that airs on the news. We tell stories that'll make you just laugh like crazy and then tear up. We see the highs and the lows, and we see people on their best days and their worst days. Man, we're the grunts. <laughs> we're the grunts. We're the, uh, the first ones there, the last ones to leave, whatever situation's going on. Try and get our viewers to be at the scene. I want to try and bring them into the story as best that I can. One day, you could be, you know, covering a pileup crash on I-35 to the next day, you know, just at a fair somewhere. I truly believe journalism is a public service, whether it's informing people about what's going on at the city council meeting next week, or just telling them what the everyday local citizens are doing to improve the lives of others around them. I think those stories really matter and they make a difference in people's lives. They can change people's minds. They can change people's hearts. Hello there and welcome to the Eyes of Texas, our special edition of CBS 11 News where we get to show off the talents of the people on the other side of the camera. The photojournalists here where we work that bring you the images and the stories that you get to see on the news every single day. I'm Doug Dunbar. Every day we bring you the news that we feel is important to our community. Some of those stories we know are heartbreaking, some are inspirational, others are interesting, some days they're just fun. Today, we want to share with you some of the photojournalist staff's favorite stories from 2021. We're going to start off with a great one from photojournalist Mike Kinney. I love to tell fun, interesting, inspirational stories, and I found all of that in one man, Don Isaac, 82 years old and still setting world records in track and field. And he's inspiring the young kids that are practicing with him. And I felt like that was a story that people needed to hear. Feet to the top of the pole, don't look at the bar. I love the feeling of flying through the air. Pole vault's really difficult because you're carrying this long pole and it doesn't like bend on its own. You have to use a lot of uh, strength and control to bend it. We're at the Texas Express uh, Training Center uh, located in Princeton, Texas. Nice jump, dude. We just got a, a great club of kids from about 10 years old to 82. Come on, Don. I'm Don Isett. I'm 82 years old. And I pole vaulted in junior high and high school. <laughs> and then didn't take it back up until I was 66 years old. Try to always kick your feet to that top hand. Because, you know, like I'm always telling you, you're just kind of shooting out a little bit. I just got bored with my hobbies. And I found out about Masters Track from some older people that were working out over to Richardson High School Track. And I got interested in it and entered a meet. And uh, I've been stuck in it ever since. That could have been a world record right there, man. Uh, how many people are your age are in the competitions? Not very many. That's, uh, that's a downside of, of reaching 82. Uh, the competition thins out quite a bit the further you go. You know, I'm just hoping I got half the energy and vigor that he does, but I'm hoping I can tie my shoes when I'm 82. What do people say when you tell them, well, yeah, we've got an 82-year-old on the pole? Well, their jaw drops about down to the floor, and they go, really? And then they, they, they're, you know, and then as soon as they see it, you know, I, I always got it on my phone, and I love showing it to people. It's really inspiring to see him jump. He has such a great work ethic, and I love watching him jump. It helps me to jump harder because I hope to be like him when I'm his age as well. Let's go, Don. Won all the national outdoor championships, and I've won all but one of the indoor championships. I got second in one meet, but five out of six senior Olympics championships. Well, I didn't do it in college. I, I was not good enough. I, I'd only done 10 feet. And, uh, but after I got back in masters and uh, got some coaching, uh, I think the highest I've jumped in a meet was 10, 11, and three quarters. It was one of the highlights of my life was, was getting over those bars. You know, we've been, we've been there for, you know, I, I want to say 
probably five or six you know world records now so it's just been a heck of a ride and i just he's driven he's, he's a neat person to be around like i said he's a top on, if he's not the most interesting person i've been around i mean he's he's top three what do you and the others your age say about don i mean i mean we mostly just talk about how incredible it would be to have world records and especially at that age it's really impressive and it just gives us someone to look up to during practice third attempt world championship big don world record attempt let's go bye bye how long are you going to keep going as long as i can I, I love everything about it good day at the office sir as a sports photographer i love to cover all different kind of sports whether it be professional high school this one particular family the vernon family they play everything. They play uh, softball, baseball, football, you name it, they play it. But the only way they can do those things is that they've got to do it uh, and get their grades right. And if they don't have their grades right, they can't play anything. And the one thing I took away from being around them is that they really are a family that loves each other. My mom is always with the Black Brady Bunch. And I'm not sure who the regular Brady Bunch is, but I can say if there's a Brady Bunch, we're it. We're a very athletic family. Ooh, they do a little bit of everything. Figure skating. Channing plays baseball. Swimming. <laughs> My daughter's a dancer at school, high steppers. They play soccer. They play piano. We play for the RBI, the Texas Rangers Youth League. They also volunteer and work with the U.S. Association of Umpires. We just get really, really busy. We split up a lot, go in different directions with them, but... There you go. Good job. We're able to basically instill values and work ethics and integrity and character, the things that's important in, in building children as they grow. We're mainly a baseball, softball family. It brings us all together. My dad grew up playing sports, and you know, of course, I would I would do the same because I love sports. Sports is like um, you learning life out of it, and you can get a lot out of sports, you know, to further your life um, with structure. That's the main thing: is spending time with with your children and and watching them grow. We have one biological and we have five adopted, and we've fostered two. So, yeah, but in the home right now, we have, that are ours, we've adopted five of them. And they look different, because they different, they might be different races or whatever, and they may ask, you know, are you adopted, or are you, and my children don't know otherwise, they just like, no, it's my brother, that's my sister. You know, all they know is family. Kids need love. All kids need love. And it makes me emotional. <laughs> because my expectation, you know, the question you asked was, what motivates me is that when I was growing up, my parents moved away, they separated. So I wanted to be here for my kids where if they needed somebody, I'm here. I didn't want to just say I got children and be out somewhere else. I wanted to be here to hold my kids when they have their thoughts, help them when they have questions. Let's go, Hannah! Clean it up, Hannah! It's a calling and it's a ministry and it's what we do. We do we're an excellent team when it comes to children. We're all pretty good in school. <laughs> it's always been no pass, no play. T. Hi. I have honor students. Um, all National Honor Society, those. And then the younger ones are doing very well. Academics has always been her strong suit, and that's what she likes to put forth. She likes for us to get our books so that we can come out not only being great, but having something that no one can take away from us, and that's an education. I don't see the last one leaving. I don't ever think I'll be childless, and uh, I don't want to be because as long as I have breath and can move and I'm medically okay, I got something to give back to some, some child. Desmond was an inspiration to me. He got into art to solve a problem, a lifelong challenge he, he's always had. And he does it with grace, he's humble, he's very talented. And it just shows to me that nothing is impossible. 
My name is Desmond Blair and I am from Dallas, Texas. I'm an artist. I got started with art because I was trying to solve a problem. Each day you wake up, you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know what's ahead of you, but you just have to be willing, ready, and committed to you know figuring things out and solving problems. My thought was, well, I wanna paint people because the challenge is always you have a moment to capture them and that moment has to tell a story about whoever you're painting. I saw the work um, and it's, it's just gorgeous. Everything that he does is just beautifully and stunning. And then when you learn that he doesn't have hands, um, kind of makes you think. And it makes you just realize that anything is possible and giving up is just not an option. Uh, the way I describe my situation, I don't like to think of myself as disabled. I'm just different. And so that was kind of the mindset that was echoed at home growing up uh, with my mom and my grandma. Like they both were, you know, just explained to me at a very early age, you're going to have to figure out your way of doing things. What I always wanted to see as a kid was somebody like myself overcoming, I guess, if you will, the way that they were born. And so if I can do that as an African-American voice and also like give a voice to, you know, maybe other um, African-American kids with limb differences out there, then I think I'm okay with doing that. Everything that he does is about serving others. And there's just something so empowering and beautiful about that. We all have like this human experience, but we're, experiencing it from different vantage points at like the same time. I think landscapes are cool, but um, just people like, I don't know, it's just something about capturing like emotion. I think that's the challenge with like each painting or portrait. I see something in the faces, whether their eyes are closed or open, looking towards us or not. There's something in the skin, in the skin tone, in the way that they're positioned. Um, you can't help but feel something. What I'd eventually like to do with my art is get to the point to where I could use it for philanthropy purposes. Because I think at the end of the day, what I, I want to be able to do uh, is use, I feel like it's a gift that I was given. And I want to be able to use it to help other people with limb differences. And if I could do that, I think if I got to the end of my life, I'd help. Coming up, you're about to meet a big fan of the big rivalry. Boomer Center! And we take a look at some Fort Worth history in a place called Hell's Half Acre.